A peace that was truly permanent would be the same as a permanent war. This, although the vast majority of party members understand it only in a shallower sense, is the inner meaning of the party slogan, War is Peace. Emmanuel Goldstein, The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism. Hi there, welcome back. Let's continue our Serpentine journey through history's greatest novel. In chapter 52, Don Quixote challenges the son of the Duke's banker vassal to a duel in defense of Doña Rodriguez's daughter. Then, two letters arrive from Teresa Panza, one to the Duchess and the other to her husband. Central throughout is the conflict between the outmoded codes of conduct of feudalism and the increasing social mobility of the modern world. The narrator reports that Sidiamete reports that Don Quixote tires of his courtly existence and longs to depart for Zaragoza, where he plans to win the suit of armor offered to the victor at such festivals. This refers to the chivalric games that flourished under Alfonso V, the magnanimous, whose empire included Aragon, Barcelona, Naples, Valencia, Sicily, Mallorca, Sardinia, and Corsica. It is difficult to separate nostalgia for the reign of Alfonso V from the Duke and Duchess's estate on the Ebro River and Sancho's rule on the Isle of Barataria. Also, Cervantes here suggests that Don Quixote's chivalric fantasy is more Aragonese than Castilian in nature. Just as Don Quixote is about to take leave of the Duke and Duchess, Doña Rodriguez enters the palatial hall with her daughter. The narrator tells us that Rodriguez is acting independently, that this is not another trick by the nobles or their staff. Rodriguez speaks in fabla, that is, according to the old chivalric dialect preferred by Don Quixote. She demands that Don Quixote force the Duke to marry his vassal to her daughter because to expect the Duke, my lord, to do justice by me is to ask an elm tree for pears. Did you know the empire of Alfonso V the Magnanimous extended even to Greece? Via the Kingdom of Sicily, he inherited the Duchy of Athens in 1381. When the Duke accedes to the duel, he uses legalistic contractual language. Rodriguez and her daughter must agree that all their claims against him will be resolved by Don Quixote. They place their right to justice in Sir Don Quixote's hands. The formal challenge, or repto, issued by Don Quixote embodies the social transition from feudalism to the early modern bourgeois world that we have been tracing. Plays like Guillén de Castro's Las Mocedades del Cid or Cornel's Le Cid also mark the domestication of the nobility at the courts of early modern autocrats. In these works, the aristocratic right to settle differences by duels makes a final appearance before it yields to the bureaucratic functionalism of the modern state. We see here something similar in this chapter. It's a reworking of Don Fernando's submission to Dorotea's claims in part one of Don Quixote, although at a lower social level. On one hand, Don Quixote formulates his challenge in noble Virgilian terms. The principal purpose of my profession is to pardon the humble and punish the proud. And the Duke vows to provide a proper field, applying his justice equally to both parties as all princes who provide a free field to all those who duel in their realms are obligated to do. Quixotic Mission. Which right did the nobility of Western Europe relinquish toward the end of the early modern period? A, the right to kill each other. B, the right to their pensions. C, the right to marry each other. Correct answer, A, the right to kill each other. On the other hand, Don Quixote comically admits that Rodriguez's claim on behalf of her daughter is pathetic. It would have been easier not to have been so gullible as to believe the promises of lovers. 
Moreover, Don Quixote actually breaks the rules of chivalry here. Technically, he is not allowed to challenge a man who is not at least an Hidalgo like himself. And so, I renounce my Hidalgo caste, and I lower and adjust myself to the commoner status of the offender, and I make myself his equal, thus giving him the right to enter into combat with me. Then, because the younger man is absent, the narrator tells us that the Duke accepted the challenge in the name of his vassal. So we have a chain of social confrontations. Rodriguez's daughter is from the lowest caste, an illegitimate laborer, although she claims pure Christian blood. Don Quixote is from the lowest caste of nobility, and the Duke and Duchess are from the high nobility. If we think back to Rodriguez's story in part two, chapter 48, here she seems to be demanding justice for her daughter via Don Quixote as a means of avenging her husband's death. The Duchess's reaction emphasizes this formal conflict. The Duchess ordered that from that moment forward, they were not to be treated like her servants, but rather as enterprising ladies who had come to her house seeking justice. That's all for now. Join me next time as we continue interpreting the most important literary masterpiece in the Spanish language. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.